we need go on a war footing. When we started World War II, we went on a war footing and changed every aspect of society overnight. I mean, you know, people couldn't use sugar, people couldn't drive, we had ration books, and no one complained because they knew we were on a war footing. I, I've, I've had the opportunity of spending three days on the campus of Caltech as the, as the 15th uh, uh, Lawrence and Memorial Lecture Program. The program started in 1970, and, and it was interesting. The, uh, uh, the number eight was Dr. Land of Polaroid uh, back in 1982. So it's, and, I've, and I've had the opportunity to, to sit in the offices of, of about nine individual, real senior faculty members. Uh, when I just finished with, I said, when did you start getting interested in about energy? And he said, 30 days ago. Uh, I mean, what Caltech is now doing, thank God, is that the leadership is starting to realize of all the issues that are, gonna, that are dangerous for the world, energy is probably number one on the list, and we aren't doing anything about it. And peak oil is an issue that, if I'm correct, is going to consume us in the next five years. And, and so there is an urgency to it that is just unbelievable. And I was giving a talk on this last week, and out of curiosity, I decided to Google peak oil and see how many occurrences popped up, and there were 3.1 million. I Googled global warming, and there were 80.5 million. And I kind of suspect that's not a bad gauge of the number of people that are concerned about one versus the other, and that would be vice versa. We need a bona fide wake-up event. We need to go to a war footing. And then we need to do two, two projects that turned out to be two of the greatest things that we did in the 20th century simultaneously. The Manhattan Project and the Marshall Plan. The Manhattan Project was a culmination of a decade worth of studying as to how we basically created energy out of the atom. The Marshall Plan was a far less understood and far more heroic plan that was set in motion by George Marshall when after the war he, for the first time, had the opportunity of traveling across Europe as he was going to spend six weeks in Moscow to try to actually recreate an alliance to help rebuild Europe. He couldn't believe that Europe was flattened. You know, he'd been the person responsible for all logistics. It was so much worse. He then spent six weeks in the Kremlin and realized that these guys aren't our friends anymore. They think this is terrific. With the devastation of Europe, the Red Army will be on the Atlantic Ocean within five years. And having agonized through at the end of World War I, watching that we never ended the war, he came back and convinced Truman, we have got to basically engage America in rebuilding Europe. As much as people hate the idea of going back to getting involved. So he gave a very simple speech at Harvard commencement, 1947, and he basically scared the bejesus out of America that unless we rebuild Europe, we will have a depression. And it was the depression fear that convinced America and 2,500 gifted Americans, labor leaders, university leaders, business people, went on sabbatical and became Marshall planners. In World War II, we had nothing. We had no war machine at all when, when Germany invaded uh, Poland. Within seven years, the war was over. And the cost of that is we flattened Europe and Japan because of the Marshall Plan. In less than seven years, we rebuild it. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm enough of an optimist about the ingenuity of human nature that when our back is to the wall, we get going. I'm worried that basically we're running out the clock of doing a lot of things that could really alleviate this awful nightmare future. By being in denial that we'll never have peak oil, the resources are so abundant, Technology will bail us out. All of these, uh, you look at how much heavy oil we have. All of the arguments that I hear day in and day out as to why I'm an alarmist, saying every day we lose, we're running out the clock. If we had had data reform, and all of a sudden we have the production history for the top 200 oil fields, maybe top 500, um, I could single-handedly, in less than a week, take that data and do the decline profiles and come up with the world's single most credible profile, say, like it or not, here is the trajectory of supply, and here was the trajectory of demand, and we know one thing, it is very hard to invent a new source of energy. That's why nuclear power was the only thing we invented in the 20th century. We need to start an R&D program 
more intense than we've ever done all across the board and don't pick a winner. Just try to figure out whether there are some winners. But in the meantime, we need to organize a global conference of leaders, far more serious than those leaders that assembled in San Francisco after World War II that created the United Nations, and, and educate all the leadership about the consequences of having passed peak oil while we were still building highway systems that envisioned that the rest of the world would drive with the intensity of Mexico. It can't happen. And the only way we will win the peak oil war is to adopt a very different lifestyle of how we travel, how goods travel and how we travel. Because literally there isn't any other solution. None of the conventional wisdom solutions actually work. Convention wisdom solutions, we should just have higher cafe standards. Uh, we should basically invent a 100 mile per hour gallon car. I think that'll happen anyway, as prices finally go way, way up, which they're bound to. But it takes an eternity to create a new car. And we have 900 million internal combustion engine vehicles on the road. So, so, so don't, don't even go there. Uh, you know, I mean, encourage that stuff to happen, but it, but that, that's a, that's a post us solution. What's a, what's an us solution? My single, you know, best idea, uh, I actually got from our mayor of Houston, Bill White, who has a program in place today called Flex in the City. We're giving City of Houston awards for the companies who adopt the best flexible workers to allow people to work when they want and where they want and pay by productivity. And when you think about it, here we are in 2000 and almost 2008, and society still has a mentality that was created during the, during the beginning of the Henry Ford automation, that to keep a job, you have to show up and punch a time clock. Uh, and, and, you know, and even sophisticated companies that don't have time clocks, their supervisors get real nervous if Tom's not at his desk at 9 a.m. Two thirds of the 12,500 miles that the average vehicle in America travels is long distance commuting. We need to basically, you can't prohibit people from long distance commuting, but if we adopted flexible work girls and started paying by productivity, people are smart. They would start coming into their office for regional meetings occasionally and, and visit each other by webcam and email and be 10 times more productive. We need to start growing food where we live. This idea that came out of the blue in the last 30 years, it was, it was fabulously entertaining to go into a, you know, Albertson store or, you know, whatever, any place in the world, and see these beautiful array of fruits and vegetables, and, and then you actually see that this stuff doesn't have any taste to it. And the meat that basically traveling from Argentina and Australia had to have so many additives in it, it would rot. Well, it's not, it's not the organic versus pesticide, the energy we consumed by that luxury, ornamental luxury, was so just enormous. And so we have to get used to going back to living in villages, mentally. We're in victory gardens. And that's another great outgrowth of World War II, we had victory gardens. I grew up in a farming community in Davis County, Utah, and we had the most unbelievable, still do, uh, cherries and apricots and peaches, and everybody canned. And it's amazing, I still remember you, you know, you know, we canned enough so that right before the fruit got ripe, we were using the last of our bottles. And the stuff was fabulous. I'd go and occasionally buy a peach and today and you can, you know, it takes a pocket knife to cut it. It's an ornament. Then we have to totally re-examine how we transport things. And transporting goods across American highways by trucks uh, is enormously energy intensive. And those trucks are getting three to five miles per gallon. So everyone, everyone loves to trash the SUV. You get six people in an SUV and it's an energy saver. But the semi trucks that are clogging up our highways, put those same goods on barges and ship them around the, the Panama Canal or build a super highway so you super invent the canal and, and get them to the east coast by barge traffic and you're using 1 30th, 1 35th the amount of oil. So there are, some, there are some things we can do today without waiting for technology, but we won't do them until we realize that we have a scarcity of this thing that was the underpinning of the 20th century.